Okay, so now we'll move into the, the most complex technical demonstration that we'll get into now. Um, for some of you online, this won't be complex enough. What, what I will uh, say is that um, uh, what the, the tool I'm about to demonstrate, which is Jupyter Hub, um, in about two weeks or so, we're going to do a dedicated webinar which just does a really deep dive into this particular tool. It can be pretty complex to access for those that haven't used it before, uh, and even for those that are familiar with, uh, with Python uh, and other uh, programming languages, um, it can take a bit to get used to. So we'll show you what it can do now, um, but what we will uh, do in a couple of weeks is really do a deep dive to, to help you dig into to this. So what Jupyter Notebooks are is a way to, to educate people as to um, how to use particular types of code to do a particular type of analysis. It, it's more of an educational tool. It's not here to be a production ready system. It combines uh, documentation, examples, uh, embedded imagery, that kind of stuff, as well as snippets of live code that can be executed so that you can see the results of the code which has been explained through the notebook. This is pretty widely used at the moment, more in scientific com um, computing, but it really provides a great educational tool. What we expect for, for people to be able to do with this is really see um, what's possible doing uh, real-time analysis and then be able to access the snippets of code that will inspire you to then go and integrate that code into your own applications and create a production-ready system which uses this. Nothing that I'm about to demonstrate um, is, is production ready. We're not suggesting that anything that we've done is suitable to go to an end user. That will always need the filter of the organizations online here to interpret. This is really just to inspire ideas and hopefully to, to inspire you to think, well, actually we could do that a lot better and, and jump in and, and, and get about doing that. The way you access DEA is, is with the GitHub account. Um, we will be demonstrating, and, and the links are up on screen there, we will be demonstrating um, an Amazon deployment of the notebooks which we manage as Frontier SI. Um, for those users, most likely the more academic ones that have access to the national computational infrastructure, there is a detailed um, user guide for the NCI that is also based around notebooks, um, which uh, is on the Geoscience Australia website. Uh, on the NCI, it can be a little inaccessible, but they are looking at um, providing more commercial access now. So we're not certainly limiting this to the academic audience, but they tend to be the, um, the bigger users of that segment. So I'll now jump into the demonstration, which is really going to show you how to navigate the, the notebooks and then take you through two worked examples. Um, of course, when my Chrome just crashed before it, probably, no, I've still got those applications, wonderful. Okay, so what we see here is an example of what a notebook looks like. Up the top, we have uh, a nice amount of text to explain um, the problem. As we scroll down, we start to get into um, some, uh, some code which can be executed live in the web browser. This doesn't uh, need you to install anything fresh. Um, what I'm going to take you through is an agricultural use case. Um, what we're looking at um, is a use case around sugarcane farming in Queensland. Um, they've just undergone their main growing uh, season and, and most sugarcane farmers are now looking to harvest in that area sometime between July and November. So right now is a pretty critical time to be monitoring, um, monitoring your crops to make sure that you're not missing any uh, events, that you haven't uh, let some disease or damage go undetected uh, and, and make sure that uh, you have as much information as possible about your crops so that you can make the best on-ground decisions as to when to go about harvesting. I'm not presenting something which is going to be doing yield forecasting or anything like that. It's really about trying to understand where there are differences between different crops and then trying to use then the on-ground knowledge to work out why those differences might have occurred. The way in which we will be using Digital Earth Australia to do that um, is to build a little, uh, little data cube um, which uh, is just covering one particular property in uh, just south of Bundaberg in Queensland. It'll be loading that with uh, NDVI data, and then we'll be doing some time series querying um, in real time across multiple paddocks to try and bring up some comparison statistics. So I'll just clear the um, version I had that was running a little bit earlier, just so I was happy that things were still going. Uh, and we just clicked the little run button up here to load the case study that we need and, and to configure our area. And then I'll hit go on this first, uh, this first application. Um, which is calling a whole bunch of code that sits in the background and is accessible through the notebooks. 
is currently going through spinning up um, this cube, is populating this with about 40 different scenes of, uh, of Sentinel uh, data uh, that cover the last 30 days, um, looking at making me some easy derived products that I can start to interrogate then creating a little mapping interface that allows me to go and look at doing that. So that was you know, pretty, pretty quick. Again, this is not a production tool, this is for education, um, but it's relatively dynamic to work with. What we can see here um, is uh, the sugarcane farm that I was talking about. And what we're going to do is just a pretty simple um, uh, exploration as to how healthy a couple of different paddocks are. So I've got the ability to just draw a polygon. I'll do that by just drawing around this paddock here and clicking on my first little point to finish. Um, this again brings up that NDVI example that I showed in National Maps earlier, where what we're looking at is an index between negative one to one that just shows health. The, the, the actual number in this case is not important. What's important is the trend. And what we can see is that the health of this crop is relatively stable uh, over time in this particular paddock. Um, now what we want to do is start to bring in some comparisons to see if everything else is performing the same way. So I'll move over to this other little bit of uh, paddock uh, over to the east. And what we can see overlaid now in orange is that second paddock um, where we can see that uh, through the middle uh, of August, it was tracking pretty much the same as our first benchmark paddock. And then over the last couple of weeks, things have started to decline in terms of health. This may be as simple to explain as that crop has now been harvested and it's no longer there anymore. Um, but if that's not the case, this might start to demonstrate some underlying disease issue or, or, or something like that that would allow us to then go out into the field and investigate in, the, in a little bit more depth. Obviously, this particular example is a small property and, and um, some of this information may have just been obvious. But uh, a lot of uh, organisations, particular corporate farmers, but also really large cropping and grazing um, uh, production uh, farms uh, won't be able to get out to do all this stuff in the field and this allows them a pretty quick way to have a look at differences. We don't just have to look at drawing whole, whole polygons, we can also put in a range of individual points um, across the, the map as well that'll do a pixel drill over time and just dive into individual sample sites across this to have a look at if anything else was particularly wrong. But we see that here, all of those points are really conforming to that overall paddock trend. This isn't something which is localized to a particular corner of the paddock, uh, and that gives us some, go some more information to go and work with. Um, so leaving that, uh, that example there, I'll now move on to um, a different example uh, using different products in a different industry. So this one we're gonna take through is a mining case study. Uh, in this case, we're looking over in Western Australia, where it's a requirement for all mining companies to be reporting on the amount of land which their mining activities has disturbed over their mining tenements. And based on the amount of land that is disturbed, they need to pay a certain contribution into a mining rehabilitation fund. And then as they start to rehabilitate the mine after it's closed off and that disturbed land uh, reduces and the land rejuvenates back to its natural form, the amount of contribution they pay into that fund decreases. The way in which they uh, report on that is to commission um, uh, consultants to go out onto the field, generally accommodations of ecologists and surveyors, that will head out there about once a year, uh, do some mapping, uh, create some reports, and that's what gets submitted into the fund. Um, there is no suggestion that there's anything wrong with that process. That will still need to happen. However, there are a couple of things that we can't do through that. One is to monitor uh, in near real time whether there have been any impacts to our site that occur in between that yearly interval. Let's say maybe there was a landslip or, or, or a cave-in in an underground mine that has caused um, damage uh, on the surface. Uh, say only one month after those consultants had beat out onto field, we wouldn't find that out uh, for another 11 months. Our contributions back into that fund would increase and we may have been able to get, that, get out there earlier and undertake some remediation efforts before our yearly reporting. The other thing that it does is it gives us uh, some data we can use to sanity check consultants report or to find out over that year when particular changes in the field might have occurred. The way we're going to demonstrate this one is to use the fractional cover data set, which Trevor talked about earlier. Um, he talked about using it to uh, look at um, detecting when a cropping pattern had changed. Here we're going to really dig into one of the bands of it, which is the fact that uh, it measures 
um, alive vegetation, it measures um, brown vegetation, and it measures bare earth. So obviously when we're looking at disturbed land, the amount of bare earth which is visible is a really good indicator for that. We've also combined that with the water observations from space product, so we can see if there's any uh, kind of flooding events or, or if there's any impact to, to mine watering as well. Here I'm not quite going to load this one in real time. This data cube, which I populated a little earlier, has about 400 different uh, tiles of, of imagery and derived products inside it. It does load pretty quickly. It takes about 90 seconds to populate this one. However, in a live demo, uh, 90 seconds can feel like an eternity. So we're just going to deal with, uh, with this preloaded example here. So the first thing I'm going to do is see what's happening with my recovering mine site, which is in the middle. You can see that there's some tree growth here, but it definitely looks definitely looks different to the surrounding environment. So if I just draw a, a pretty rough outline of, of this uh, recovering mine site here, that's just gone in, in real time and produced a plot over the last five years about how the proportion of bare earth has changed um, and the same with uh, brown vegetation uh, and green vegetation. We see some seasonality in here, which is showing the cycle of vegetation growing during wet seasons and, uh, and, and leaves falling off. Uh, during dry seasons, um, but it shows us a bit of a pattern. Unfortunately, this pattern by itself is not overly useful as it doesn't give us a comparison to show us how uh, this particular mine rehabilitation is working compared to the natural environment. However, we can see just over to the west here, we've got an area that looks pretty natural that we can use as a base case. So if I draw a nice big little com uh, comparison area there, again, in real time there, it's just gone to do an analysis of that same data. And now we start to get a little bit more useful information. This graph up the top is the one that we want to focus on. And this is showing the amount of bare earth um, that is visible. So the amount of disturbed land that we're tracking over time. In orange, we see our benchmark area of the natural environment, where clearly back in 2013 and 14, you can see that there's a lot less bare earth visible than in the mine site. Uh, this was just after the mine uh, started its recovery efforts. Uh, and here we have actually quite a good news story. What we can track over the five years up until now is that the amount of disturbed land that we have each year is slowly decreasing and we can really see um, with, you know, pretty um, empirical data that uh, over time we have been closing the gap to the natural environment and our rehabilitation efforts here are really having a positive impact on our, on our rehabilitation. This would also have allowed us, if in uh, a couple of months in a row, we'd seen a significant deviation in any of these um, any of these tracking points. That would probably be a trigger for us that something had happened on site. We could dig into the visual imagery to see what happens or send our consulting teams out there earlier. So that's a level of demonstration that I'm going to go into into the Jupiter Hubs. Again, in two weeks, we'll take people through the mechanics of everything that happens in the background. The other thing I'd like to highlight is for those of you who are wanting to go and deploy the infrastructure which underpins what we've been talking about for your own purposes, um, you can do that as well. So Digital Earth Australia is the Australian government deployment of the Open Data Cube. The Open Data Cube is an open source uh, piece of technology which can be deployed for anybody and, and is currently being deployed uh, globally for a range of both uh, private industry and government applications. Um, what the cube in a box is, is a way that we've simplified the deployment of that so that it takes only about three minutes to go and set something up and then about five minutes to go and index the data that you want to point it to. This really allows you to point it at any particular index data source that you want to, including the, the global Landsat 8 data archive that Amazon hosts. You can still point it back at the Digital Earth Australia data as well, or you might be wanting to um, point it at some other raster data that you have hosted on Amazon somewhere. We're not going to dig deep into this one, but if you want to talk more about that, uh, Felix and Alex uh, are the people that created this cube in a box deployment and can be used to answer those questions. Speaking of answering questions, we've covered a lot of information pretty quickly there. So we're going to be distributing the slide packs, we're going to be posting this video if there's a particular bit you wanted to watch again and catch some information that you missed. Uh, but if that doesn't work, then we want to give you a range of different methods that you can use um, depending on the kind of question and support that you need. In terms of um, technical questions about Digital Earth Australia or the broader Open Data Cube, there is a Slack community which you can register for at the web link there. 
um, that will give you access to a global community that can answer your questions about the Open Data Cube, but there are particular channels in there that focus on Digital Earth Australia, both as the infrastructure, but also as the products. Um, obviously, uh, us at Frontier SI here are available to answer questions around the Jupyter Notebooks, also about anything to do with the webinars, the workshops that we've got coming up, and the broader uh, private industry consultation that we're running. Anything that's about Digital Earth Australia more generally, or particularly about the data, you can always contact Yes Science Australia or on their Earth Observation email address. We've talked about a lot of product uh, products that have been created but haven't gone into detail about what they are. That's because that does take a bit of time, but the full descriptions are available on the Geoscience Science Australia website there. And a lot of the code that's been used, um, both uh, from an infrastructure perspective, but also looking at um, how some of the products are derived, can be found through the, the various GitHub accounts out there, both Geoscience Australia, uh, but also the Frontier SI ones. Those that are wanting um, help to go and spin up uh, their own uh, infrastructure, we're obviously available, but, but CSIRO also have a capability that's looking globally to help people um, uh, spin up uh, data cubes and create new derived products. And Alex Held and Rob Woodcock will be the best contacts for that. So before we jump into questions, which is what we're about to do, um, I'll just uh, hand it over to Eva to talk a little bit about what's coming up over the next uh, over the next couple of months. Thanks, Bill. So just briefly going back to what's coming up next month, we're going to have the National Workshop Series, and uh, details for that will be released shortly. We're going to be going across a number of um, capital cities in Australia, as you can see here on the slide. And the main purpose of this, again, is to have industry representatives all of you that want to start using DEA and its data to come sit with us and we're going to go uh, a lot deeper into some of the technical questions, uh, the actual accessibility issues, um, how you want to engage with us, in the, with us in the future, and then start to touch as well in the opportunities for um, a pilot projects and um, uh, upcoming um, open call for, for project proposals that we envisage at the moment. So if you haven't done so, register your interest at Frontier SI. Um, you will be receiving an update on this as soon as we have the dates. Um, but yeah, just, just jump on it quickly because as we said before, this is not going to be as open as these webinars and we are going to have strictly limited spaces. 